So, um, yeah, today I am going to talk about a new initiative uh, that Circa is undertaking. And it's really about building capacity um, in, in British Columbia across a variety of professions, across uh, the geo the, the, our geographical um, area that we have here in BC. And um, this is uh, the initiative that we're, we're taking on is about uh, training, developing training resources, developing um, modules uh, for service providers and for families. Um, but it's not, it's not intended to duplicate or replicate or take over any other's training initiatives. We have uh, many uh, provincial partners that uh, all already do um, a lot of great training uh, in this province for both families and professionals. And uh, we're really here to complement the, the work that's being done and to take a look and fill in some of those gaps. So these are some of some of the partners that um, have worked uh, with us to help create um, a sort of our next steps and our priority for what we're going to do over the next three and a half years now. So what are we doing? Well, uh, back in 2016, 2017, when I was uh, with government, um, I led a cross-ministry autism services and supports review. And one of the things that came out of that was the need to build service capacity among existing service providers. So it's not like, let's create a whole new level of service providers, let's create a whole new system. Kids go to rec centers, kids go to their physician, kids go to schools, kids go to have EAs, kids have after school care, kids are in community. And who in community needs to know more about ASD and related disorders so that we can improve uh, inclusion for um, uh, children and, and, their, and their families. And so um, the project purpose, we were sort of mandated to uh, develop uh, a, a coordinated and comprehensive strategic plan on training and resources, and that's pretty much where we're at right now. We've just gone through the strategic plan uh, process, so I'm going to kind of walk us through where we're at now. Um, uh, of course, this is all about not just training those who are already out there in the field, but figuring out if our priority is of a certain profession, how can we infuse more training about autism and related disorders into their post-baccalaureate or post-secondary programs as well. And that's not just at UBC, but it's at SFU, UVic, the variety of colleges across the province. So it's really <coughs> taking the, the, um, uh, the view of Circa, which is interdisciplinary research and collaboration across a variety of institutions. Um, the, the kind of deliverable that we're kind of looking towards uh, creating is uh, uh, developing um, a series of free online professional development modules and resources. So those could be a, a module that you uh, would kind of get a traditional sort of module of learning. It could be a workshop with a talking head. It could be a handout resource. It will be whatever's needed for that topic. And I'll get into a bit more about how we're going to do that. We also want to ensure that all these resources are adapted and accessible for families and caregivers across the province. And of course, one of the initiatives that I'm tasked with doing is sort of evaluating this uh, whole initiative. At the end of the day, did we make a difference? Is, uh, are more people knowing uh, more stuff? So what I'm going to talk to you about today is just talking through the co-design process. And so we really talked about a co-design uh, when um, uh, when Circa got the proposal or set out the proposal to do this, it was it covered quite a wide range of uh, training for what a wide range of professions, and that's a lot of work to do in three three and a half years because I've been going since May and doing all of this pre work. So really, it was about. Um, talking with the community, working with a lot of those um, organizations that you saw up there and asking what do, who does need to be trained, what do they need to be trained at, and really kind of co-designing that, that, those targets together. So uh, we're going to talk about what to target, who to target. Um, I've done a bit of work on what already exists, and there's a lot that already exists. It's not as well organized and accessible as we'd like it to be, uh, but there is a lot out there. I'll talk through our stakeholder engagement meeting that we went through, uh, the priorities that we set, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about adult learning and the differences between face-to-face -face and online learning environments, because I think that that's really who we're targeting here. We're targeting adults, and so what is it? What are the things that we need to consider when we move forward into, de into developing um, training materials? 
So let's start with the co-design process. Well, um, I was lucky enough to be able to either travel or um, now we're so great on Zoom and phone. And I actually, uh, on Thursday evening, have a meeting with uh, a parent group in, in uh, Salmon Arm. So I'm still kind of connecting with families uh, who have reached out. They couldn't, uh, uh, I couldn't chat with them before, and so we're chatting now. But I've, I've talked with over 45 separate interviews uh, with over about 250 stakeholders from across the province. Those include families and self-advocates and caregivers and service providers and service professionals and government folks and educators and First Nations organizations, physicians themselves, school districts and a variety of, of stakeholders to figure out who needs what and why. And so really this was about, uh, it's not, this is not a big qualitative study. I'm not putting that out there as this. They were basically interviews that were asking sort of some basic questions to dig down deep. And so where did I go? I was in the light. I did a lot of work in the Lower Mainland. Uh, I've chatted with folks in Prince Rupert, in Sycamus, in Kamloops, in Kelowna, in the Kootenays, in Fort St. John, in Prince George. Plus, I've met with a variety of provincial organizations, such as the BC Association for Child Development and Intervention, Children and Youth with Special Needs uh, Consultants across the province, and the BC Public Secondary, um, uh, Post-Secondary Human uh, Service Articulation folks who, have, who are, uh, uh, rep have representatives from across the province. So what did we find? I guess be the questions I asked were, who needs to be trained, what do they need to know, and how do they need to know it? So it's those really basic questions, and we just had open discussions around that. And as you can imagine, um, people sort of related it to either their field of work or where they're, or if they had a child with autism to where they were in their life period or looking back to the earlier days of who would might need more um, uh, training. Um, as well as talking to self-advocates, uh, adults with autism themselves, to kind of say from their perspective um, uh, what needs to happen. And so I've got about 35 different target populations. Now you can see why we're doing a co-design because I can't, we can't do 35 different target populations. So, but this is sort of first what we found. Um, uh, and this is really sort of by the percentage of not people, but the percentage of group, uh, interview groups. So if I interviewed 10 people, if that group said physicians, they would just get one vote for that group. So um, what we found was about, so looking sort of rounding out, say, the top 10 or top 15, um, people found that they really wanted their physicians, their pediatricians, their residents, uh, diagnosticians to know more. A lot of people were talking about having uh, not just them themselves as families, but uh, fathers were specifically mentioned, but extended family members, friends. How do I explain autism to everybody? I keep having to explain it and talk about it, and my uncle doesn't really know what it means, and you know, what can I uh, do to, to help better understanding there? Social workers, uh, STAD nav navigators, and, and they are social workers who work sp in a specific program uh, called Services to Adults with Developmental Disabilities, and they are tasked with um, uh, being the navigator or the coordinator of kids uh, with autism and related and FASD um, during the transition period from age 16 to 25. Um, and then there's also FSI resource parents, so this, there's Family Support Institute has resource parents across the province. These are volunteer parents who families can call and, and if they want to have an advocate or somebody help them, um, and so it's those folks knowing more about autism, Community Living BC staff. Again, teachers, education assistants, special ed were really high on the list of people who said needed to know more. And then there was this whole area around employers and co-workers and human resource professionals and, and uh, anything to do with sort of work um, and not just sort of supporting the individual themselves but supporting the people around them. When you go to an interview, sort of they don't you know, it, it's in a typical interview, my, I, I'm not doing very well. So maybe the HR needs to know a little bit more about autism and related disorders and what to do. Early childhood educators, child care providers, mental health clinicians, that's children and youth with mental health, psychiatrists, mental health case managers, uh, developmental disabilities, mental health. Uh, rounding out sort of the top 14 or 15 or uh, basically families, people were saying it would be great if small businesses or communities or my hairstylist people, uh, I just felt more included in my community in general. Uh, principals because they tend to be sort of the gatekeepers of what's going on in, in the school system. 
and then frontline service providers. And those are sort of the, the frontline service providers, uh, I feel, are the ones that are, that are here. They're watching this type of video. They're going to all the, the sessions already. And so, um, uh, you know, it, it's great that board certified behavior analysts, board uh, um, behavior consultants, SLP, OTs, uh, behavior interventionists, but we're not necessarily, they are going to a lot of training already. So that uh, when we took a look at priorities, we kind of looked at who really is in the need for more training. Um, front and then nurses, nurses on reserve, respite workers, dental, dental hygienists, and as you see the list can go on, recreation, peers, disability support workers, the Head Start program, uh, AIDP and uh, IDP, that's uh, Aboriginal Infant Development Program, Infant Development Program, who work with a lot of the um, kids who are just sort of thought at risk or just sort of somebody, a parent says, well, I, something going on with my kid, I need a little help, they can go uh, into these programs or the um, Aboriginal Supported Child Development or Supported Child Development Program. Um, service providers for Indigenous peoples and Indigenous populations, parent advisory committees, youth justice, emergency operators, eye doctors, medical office assistants, uh, you've got the list in front of you, sexual health educators, all the way down to landlords needing to know more. So we span from physicians down to landlords in terms of who needs to know more. So we really, uh, as, a, as a result of sort of getting out there and finding out um, who needs to be trained, what do they need to train, and we found a broad range of, of topics and ideas of disciplines or, or target populations that came up. So the next question that I asked, or the question that was part of the interviews that I asked folks were, what do you think they need to know? You know, what does, when we talked about physicians, or, and so physicians is our first example here, what do you think they need to know? You know, what, what do they need to know more about, about autism? And so um, this is just an example. I actually have a, a whole, you know, a whole uh, document which covers, it's about, you know, 20 pages long, which, which covers each of those things from physicians to landlords and saying what, what do they, those folks need to know. And so um, a lot of it is around understanding, awareness, referral, in the, in, as you can see with physicians, co-occurring conditions, uh, not just co-occurring mental health, but health conditions as well, uh, physical and health needs, medications, <coughs> things like that. So this again is all this background information so that when we get to the stakeholder meeting that I'm going to talk about, people had the information at their fingertips to help make decisions around what priorities uh, were going to be set for British Columbia for this training initiative. And also um, involved in that background work was a cross-jurisdictional review of what exists, what exists in BC online, what exists in Canada online, and what exists in sort of key international sites online, right? So, you know, it's all well and great. We could say, well, we're going to target landlords and we're going to do this, but maybe there's something else that's already out there that has that topic for that profession. And so why would we sort of reinvent the wheel? Again, the idea here of the circuit training initiative was not to duplicate, not to take over, not to be sort of the trainer for everything, was just to complement and figure out what's out there. And and even in some respect, coordinate what's out there so that it's more accessible um, to those professions. So um, I went through each of the areas. I did the province of British Columbia separately itself because um, that's our province and we, there is a lot of uh, good work that's going on here. And um, basically, I, I just did a document of what exists. And these are all, they're all hyperlinks. And this one was 24 pages long. And it basically went through sort of all of the things that, that exist in BC, all the way from autism community training, all the way to um, what's available on the Inclusion BC website. So it's, these are resources, or they are online videos, or there could be some web streaming that was live. Um, and then I, you know, it indicated if it w what it was and what target audience it was. Canada as well, that's again a, another huge document. I spent a lot of time sitting online staring at my computer um, like we all do. I think I need better glasses now um, uh, it, to be able to kind of see what's available out there. And you see on this example, when we start with Autism Nova Scotia, you can see that Autism Nova Scotia has free modu uh, online modules uh, most of them are an hour. There's one that takes seven hours to complete. There's one which is on um, autism spectrum disorder, counselor training for camp counselors, 
right? So uh, a lot of those things, very narrow, very um, specific, but a lot of those things were coming up in my meetings with folks. You know, I, I do want those rec providers to know more. I do want people to know more. So it's like, oh, there are some things that exist, but how would a camp counselor in British Columbia know that there's an online module for them that's, that's up in Nova Scotia? And, and right now they, they don't necessarily know that unless they did some, some big time digging. Um, so again, you can see there's a variety of things. And there, are, there is a, a ton of information explaining autism. There's a ton of information out there which says you know, sort of the what is autism. But it's interesting because it's like, does it really cross the presentation? Or is it just about the cute kid who's nonverbal or the older kid who's, uh, you know, like the good doctor, right? So what, what is the, the variety of presentations out there? The international sites, again, I focused, I, you know, I avoided blogs, I avoided, you know, my blog on, you know, different things and here are my resources. But really, here's Queensland's, Queensland Centre for Intelle Intellectual and Developmental Disability, who have a variety of uh, resources, uh, YouTube videos for, um, uh, for physicians and health practitioners on, you know, how to do health assessments and other things. So I really focused on sort of the mind institutes of the world, you know, the, the Yale University, the um, international sites, uh, Australia, ARC, um, things like that to take a look. So once I got all that information, we thought, okay, well, how do we take the information of who needs to be trained, what do they need to know, and then what exists? So this is where some more, and I want to be very clear, these weren't, um, the, the list of what exists isn't vetted. Like, I didn't watch every single one. I think I'd be here, I think I, we'd know, that would take the full four years plus another 20. Um, but they aren't vetted, but they did come from, I didn't, again, I, I chose sort of reputable sites, Geneva Center, things like that. So, you know, we haven't dug in deep to what those were. But as you see down here, I took a, ch I took a thing saying, oh, here's physicians, here's what people said they need to know, and here's what currently List, uh, exists online. It might not have to do with physicians and what physicians specifically need to know, but it might have to do with in Canada, you know, for A1 here was um, in ACTS, they have a, 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 um, a video on the role of medication in the management of ASD, right? So it, they, these, these connected so that we could actually dig in deep when we get, when we get our priorities, we at least have some basics to work from uh, to dig in deep there. So this brought us to the stakeholder engagement meeting that was done in October, uh, and that included uh, um, um, most of the organizations that you saw on the first slide. And this was really about um, examining uh, the stakeholder summary, so who needs to know what and what exists. It was about having small group discussions about um, looking at where people think the gaps were, and it was about recommending high-level priorities for um, Circa to, um, uh, to undertake over the next three and a half years. So I asked them questions like, you know, do we focus on developing new training resources for uh, the sp a few specific target um, uh, professions or paraprofessionals? Uh, if so, who and what topics? Or do we focus on developing new training resources on a specific topic and then have that topic broaden out for a variety of disciplines? If so, what topic and for who? Or do we uh, focus on organizing some of that existing resources? How do we do it and for what topics and whom? Or do we do a combination? So we sort of set the group out to do this and gave them these questions and they went into small groups and, and they had a discussion. And you know, we also made sure that they understood that this wasn't simply about sort of the first past the post. It wasn't about taking our list and saying, well, the first one is physicians, the second one is family, and the third one is, I forget, but as I look up here, um, you know, teachers. So we're going to do those three. And it wasn't just about that. It was about using the expertise in the room. We had um, individuals with ASD themselves. We had a, a lot of the service organizations for autism and related disorders, Inclusion BC, uh, Family uh, Support Institute, a variety of organizations who serve and help uh, families navigate the system throughout the province. And basically, um, talked to them and said, you know, maybe it's about creating as many resources as we can in the most effective and efficient manner, but that really get towards what are the top priorities that you folks in the room think you, that needs to happen. So we got some priorities. 
um, I'm happy to say. And that's sort of where we're at now, this setting of the, these high-level priorities. And the priorities that were set by the community stakeholders is really about um, they've asked us to t get existing resources, to examine the existing resources, uh, coordinate uh, those existing resources, identify the gaps, um, and uh, create new resources and training opportunities for these three service fields. So for these three service fields, we're going to be looking at existing resources, uh, we're going to coordinate what already exists, we're going to actually vet some of them more, look, look deeper into that. Um, identify where the gaps are and create new resources that are specific for the field of medical professionals. Now you see here we got a bit broader. Their recommendation wasn't just the first list which was you know physicians, residents and that folks. We got a bit broader to include nurses, nurses on reserve, other medical professionals as well as dentists and dental hygienists. Um, that's a big issue with a lot of individuals with developmental disabilities is being able to go to the dentist and we spend, a, the families spend a lot of stress and time of kids getting literally put under to get their teeth cleaned. So um, that was one of the issues. The next um, a target area is child care service providers in British Columbia, as you hear on the news. Um, the, the current government is providing a lot of services or a lot of funding around child care. There are some t uh, $10 a day child care options that are pilot projects out there. And so a lot of families are saying when we met across the province were that's really great, but sometimes these are private child care providers, and sometimes private child care providers think, oh, autism or developmental disability, I don't, know what, I don't know what to do. So the child might get pushed down on the list, right, and not, might not get in. And so we need to provide these folks, they don't, they're not doing this to be malice or anything, we need, but we need to provide these folks with some more training and some more resources to support them, to better support the children uh, that they, that they um, serve in communities across BC. And that also includes Aboriginal, Aboriginal Infant Development Program, Infant Development Program, and Aboriginal uh, Supported Child Development and Supported Child Development. And, and those folks really are the ones that help support kids in child care settings. Finally, it was, uh, the group was like, adult, adult, adult. Anything to do with adult or transition to adult, like there's just, we really need more. There are some really good things happening out there. There's Ready, Willing, and Able. There's some, a variety of other um, uh, employment support initiatives out there. But a lot of folks were saying, you know, I really wish that human resource workers in general, and, you know, I've d I discover new things. There's a council of, there's a, a society of human uh, um, uh, resource workers. There's, you know, different employment organizations which work together and are interested um, in uh, improving the services for uh, individuals and having people in their companies um, with autism and, and related developmental dis uh, disabilities be employed, but they just need to know more about the resources or just need to sort of overcome that sort of hesitation, like, oh, is this gonna, is this gonna be more work for me? And, it, and, and most of the time, it's not. So those were the things. And, and this is sort of a visual of how it's set out. Now, the medical and the physicians and the diagnosticians and the dental, we are gonna, um, we've been asked by the group to create resources that really cover all of the, uh, the stages of life, everything from sort of pre-diagnosis all the way to aging. In the child care, we're going to be focusing on those first early stages, so the really early years and sort of into school entry. And in employment, of course, sort of the high school into transition into early adulthood and, of course, the vocational. So that's just a visual of where our targets are going to be. So when we take a look at the medical dental, so this is sort of the, the what, what do they need to know? Um, and these were some of the things that bubbled up to the top of what these folks need to know. Um, is understanding and awareness of the range and presentation of ASD, kind of what I talked to before, understanding that they might present differently in girls. It might look differently for uh, some individuals than others. It's not always just what you see on TV. It's not counting toothpicks or it's not, you know, I don't know, saving lives in the, in the um, for, I don't even watch The Good Doctor or Atypical. Um, uh, but it's about services and supports across the age ranges. What is out there? And then uh, looking at what are the best practices for screening and diagnosis? What are the treatment components that you need to be aware of um, that are um, best practices across the age ranges? 
what are the co-occurring health and medical health, con uh, both the health and mental health conditions, and then of course understanding behaviors. And you'll note in each of these one, understanding behaviors as a topic always continuously comes up because it's, it's, it's understanding that, you know, just because there might be a behavior there that's not necessarily autism or the developmental disability, but it's understanding why that behavior is occurring. And I have some speech paths in the room and a lot of it's communicative in, in uh, general. So childcare, again, the, the topics are going to uh, span from the early years to school entry. Again, we're going to be looking at understanding and awareness of the range of presentation, what services are available. A lot of families are talking to their child care provider about what should I be doing and where should I be going, and they're like, I, I don't know. I don't know that there's this new organization called Autism Information Services BC, which you can call and you can ask any question you'd like about autism, and they will answer it for you, right? So that's their job. And so it's getting people to understand what's out there for them, what they can access. Again, and then talking about and creating modules more about specific uh, skills, which are supporting inclusion, promoting communication, uh, motor skills, adaptive skills, and again, understanding behaviors. And then finally, the area of employment, which is again, understanding and awareness, knowing what is out there to support uh, an employer to have an individual with ASD. They're not alone. There are a lot of services out there that they can rely on and, and um, work with. And then it's talking about best practice strategies for transition to adulthood. What are the hiring practices? Sometimes the traditional interview does not work. So what do I need to know about that? Um, uh, the supports in the workplace, how to support coworkers, and again, understanding behaviors. So once I've done this, we have sort of those three um, areas, and I'll, I'll talk a bit, a bit later, sort of our next steps is we're, gonna, we're creating advisory committees for each of these areas, which will include experts and individuals themselves who are in that profession. Um, and we're going to be digging deeper into figuring out what kind of resources do you need, how do you need to know them, what do they need to look like, is it a module, is it a handout, what is it? But before we do that, I needed to know a bit more about, um, you know, people can sit and watch this and you can watch it and it's gone. People can, people often even say, even in face-to-face -face training, I went to this great workshop, I got a great binder, I had all the information, I got back and the binder's on my shelf, right? Like, oh, how are we actually going to use that information to create changes in our behavior, in our, in our practice? And so I, 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 I thought, you know, we need to dive a little bit deeper into that, um, into that world. And you know, we are living in an online world and the question comes, is online gonna take over? Like are we just, is everything gonna be online? Are we gonna be, you know, walking around with virtual things, sitting in a thing and not doing anything? And you know, a lot of the, some things I've been reading and, and it makes just common sense, perhaps no. I still, I order stuff online, but I still like going to a mall. I like to touch it, I like to try it on, I like to do it. I know that people think malls are a dying breed, but they just built a huge one in Tawasson by where I live, and when you go on a Saturday, it's packed. So people obviously still like the real world as well. Um, you know, we still have office towers. I telework, but I also have an office here. Uh, I have people in the room who telework, but they go into office. So there's a sort of a, a connection or, or sort of an overlap of both of them. So we haven't really replaced the need for face-to-face -face interaction. So we kind of have to think about that. How do, we, how do we do that when our mandate is to create online resources? So what do we need to think about when we're creating the resources? So first I want to talk about sort of adult learning and some of the things, that, and again, I'm not an, I, I'm, I'm an autism person, I'm not an adult learning person, so, um, uh, but certainly uh, I was able to sort of review some of the research uh, and see what's out there as it relates so that I could have a better understanding of the considerations we need to take uh, in, uh, uh, into, into, count, uh, into account as we, um, as we move forward. And so Dunstan Triven in 2012, they did a meta-analysis to, uh, to really look at um, adult learning and what matters most. What are the key elements that matter most? What are the practices in adult learning that led to improvements in their knowledge, in skills, in attitudes, in self-efficacy beliefs? Sort of what are the things that they needed to know? And they found that there are six practices in training or professional development that led to some of the behavior change. 
And some of them are like, you know, duh, like you're, you're not going to be sort of overwhelmed with this great new information that I'm giving you. But we have to think about these as we move forward in creating of modules. How are we going to include these things into, into what we're doing? One of them is just an introduction. You, know, you present the material, you share the material, kind of what we're doing today. Here's the, here's the material, I'm talking to you, you're sitting and listening, that's how it goes. And the next is about illustrating the material, practicing it, demonstrating it, having a, 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 some, sort of, uh, some sort of role play that you demonstrate and see what's happening with that material. The next is trying it out in real life. You know, how can we apply what I've learned in real life? How do I actively practice it? If I did it wrong, how do I problem solve? The fourth is evaluation. How do I evaluate what I did? Did I do it right? Did I figure that out? And, and if I didn't do it right, do I have access to a specialist or an instructor or someone who I can get feedback and timely feedback from? And then how am I reflecting in terms of reviewing my performance? Is there a guided self-reflection? And of course, is there some sort of standard, some sort of ticky box mastery that I know that I've, I've done it in the end? Um, they also found in, in their uh, meta-analysis that there were some moderators to learning, and that was when there was a small number of learners in a group, and that was also, so a small number of learners, and so I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to loop back to that in the online world in a bit, and as well as um, practice in the work setting for at least a minimum of 20 hours, uh, not at once, but across multiple occasions. So again, thinking about how can we do that in this, in this online world. Um, Dunstan 2015, uh, then they took a look at a couple of reviews of professional development literature and they found some concerning results. Um, many of the studies didn't include the key features um, that were necessary for effectiveness. So people weren't necessarily doing this even in the face-to-face -face environment. And only a few of them had job embedded, um, authentic learning, practitioner reflection, co coaching, mentoring service, that service type of training. Um, so let's take a look at sort of when we see kind of what's being taught. And we do know there is, there is research to, to, to uh, let us know that lectures, presentations, things like this, uh, written materials are actually quite effective. I mean, thank goodness we're here in a university and that's what, we, that's what is done uh, in the university setting, is effective in, in te teaching a lot of targeted knowledge or surface learning. But it's not as is of, is effective at teaching sort of skills, sort of, that result in behavior change. And again, I'm going to kind of lay the speech pass in the room out, but we were just talking before this about you have clinical placement. So you have that time for reflection and action, and it's embedded within your training as well. So, um, you know, and, and so the, the talking head and, and just the lecture form is in as well for that skill development. So Parsons et al. actually t also looked at a, um, uh, sort of six steps for evidence-based staff training, and they did it with um, um, practitioners uh, who in the behavior analysis world. And they found things that were very similar to the protocol of, um, of Dunstan and, and et al., which was, you know, describing the target skill. Again, they, they, they broke that down a little more. Really describe that skill in a succinct written description. Demonstrate it. Again, you see the role, the modeling and the role play. Practice it, rehearse it. So not in real life, but practice it. And then try it in real life, had feedback and kind of loop through, you know, three to five uh, uh, or four to five over and over until you hit, hit mastery. So now let's do a little bit of comparing between sort of, so those are sort of the key components to sort of learning, for adult learning to learn new skills. But let's compare sort of online versus face-to-face -face learning it and what do we know? Well, the cost. Um, in face-to-face, -face, uh, it can be expensive. We pay for the venue, we pay for the trainer, we pay for the uh, participant time uh, sometimes. You pay for food, there's food here, you've got water, there's lovely treats, we pay for um, travel, there's registration costs. Um, uh, online does too have its own set of costs. You pay for the initial investment in costs, uh, you host on a server, you've got to maintain it, you can't just let these things go stagnant, they can't be 30 years old and you're still doing, you know, training, uh, uh, having the, the same content. Uh, so it needs updating and participant registration. But there was a study done by Herman and Bannister which showed that it was less expensive, and I'll loop back to that, that it was less expensive in the long run to be online. 
Um, accessibility and flexibility uh, for face-to-face. -face. It's training for only those who are in attendance, uh, whereas uh, in the online world, it's uh, you know anybody 24/7 access it when you want. Um, there are travel barriers to get face-to-face, -face, but there's really not a lot of technology requirements. And if there is, you got a friend next to you and people next to you can help you out. Um, and it's really in the same geographical location. Whereas the other is, you know, um, uh, you know, it's there to take when you're ready and willing and, and able. Um, and uh, but you may have a barrier to technology. And in our province of British Columbia, that's not just a barrier to technology of I don't know what to click and what to do, but that could be access to high-speed internet as well. Um, engagement and interaction. Now this is one of those key components as you saw to adult learning in terms of how do people learn and that social aspect, we'll go, you know, sort of back to how people learn in a social environment and, um, and really sort of uh, in face-to-face, -face, the instructor sort of transfers the knowledge. In, 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 uh, uh, online, the instructor helps people construct their own, the learner construct their knowledge. Um, uh, in face-to-face, -face, you have in-person networking, um, uh, whereas uh, online can be an isolating experience. It doesn't have to be, but it can be. Um, you have access to immediate feedback and your mentor, the person in the room. You can, you can wait before we came into this room. Many people were talking to the instructor here afterwards. You've got that chance to ask those questions, to go to their office, to, to be right there. Um, uh, and you may be able to ex exchange ideas and ask questions, but a lot of times in the face-to-face, -face, some people may not feel comfortable to speak up. Um, and in the online environment, it uh, the actually Yanni uh, found in 2013 that it actually was less intimidating. People did speak up and did say I was less anxious to ask questions, I was less anxious to participate on chat rooms and discussion boards um, if I was, uh, uh, and they were more encouraged uh, to interact. So, you know, you may not have the dominant individuals. And, and within this system, you can establish community of practice. You're all together. You kind of have established your own sort of community of people that you can lean on. But that can also work in, in, the, in, the, um, in the online world where you can uh, have online community of practice, discussion boards, use other social media to do that. And also, um, another study showed that you can in the online, I guess in face-to-face, -face, you can uh, put this game element in. And a lot of people really gamification, it's not a new word that we're learning, um, uh, ensures sort of engagement and retention in learners. So you can put in these sort of game type of components to folks where even, uh, even folks are kind of, they test themselves and they can do a little game and they sort of get it that way. Uh, about trainee characteristics. Now, um, in face-to-face, -face, it's scheduled in your day, you know when you're going to class, you, that sort of thing. Whereas online, you need to be more self-motivated. You need to uh, have more time management skills. Uh, it's easier for the trainer to see if somebody's texting or flailing off or, you know, but you can't do that in the, in the online world. Um, uh, and so it's it really, they found that the face-to-face -face is suitable, actually one of the studies said that it's suitable more for young audiences who are just sort of starting out. So I guess, great, again, post-secondary education makes sense. It's for the young audience of people who are just sort of starting out. But we're often dealing, and so we will be targeting some of that younger audience, but we're often dealing with folks who have been in the field for a long time. So it can really work uh, better for participants uh, uh, who are working professionals, who are globally located. Um, and uh, there, one interesting fact, uh, Lou and Lemonade also took a look at sort of what are some of the moderators uh, to access to um, learning, and they found that um, it was face-to-face uh, -face was better for academically lower performers. They, they did better in that. But if you're an academically higher performer, online was, was quite well too. So that hopefully that may work for us with those folks who are already out in the field. Content is uh, as you know, very clear, it's specific to that time and place where you can update content all the time online. Uh, there's a potential to be inconsistent from one sort of workshop to the next, one sort of in, you know, people, if, if you're doing sort of the workshop thing where you're going to different places and doing a workshop, it's sort of who, who comes to that professional development, what questions were asked, so you may go a whole different road because of what was happening and the questions that were asked. Uh, whereas um, uh, online, all trainees receive access to the same consistent uh, content. The last two are on credentialing, and that was a big thing that came up in our discussions with folks. 
Um, yes, we all do. Con you know, we all do continuing education to uh, advance ourselves. But you know, there are there are incentives. Um, I just had to fill out my as all speech paths did. I was like, oh, <laughs> I haven't entered any of them yet, but I have a list of them, and you have to enter your continuing education credits. And so, are those um, valid? Can they use? Can physicians use some of the training for continuing edu edu education credits so they can be more incentivized to do it? So, so it, that can happen both in the face-to-face -face, uh, and the online world. And again, synchronicity, I couldn't help putting the police uh, album there. I know there's young people in the room, so I wouldn't recognize the album. But face-to-face, uh, uh, -face, sort of as a summary, is it really the mostly uh, synchronous interaction. Y we present in lectures. It's hands-on. It's pencil and paper. You can plan by session by session. Whereas online is, is more asynchronous, but you can have discussion forums. You can have a lot of different types of content presentation. You can have different types of assessment, but you really need to plan out for that development. So I've talked a bit about sort of what works face to face, what sort of the differences between the two are, and now let's take a look at what works with online learning, some of the, the research we found there. Well, Herman and Bannister, uh, they did, they redesigned a course for teachers for an online delivery. The course was called the curriculum, and it was really for in-service teachers. And uh, what they found is um, the results uh, w were quite well, the kids, uh, the kids, the <laughs> work with kids. Uh, the adults, uh, did, or the students did just as well in the online versus uh, the face-to-face. Um, uh, -face. So they looked at sort of what worked online. What again were those key elements that made this work online? And again, none of this is going to be shocking to you, but it's things that we got to keep reminding ourselves of. Establishing a routine of study resulted in sort of more self-regulatory practices for folks. Um, um, uh, uh, clearly articulated, sorry, I missed one, clearly articulated expectations and instructions. So, and that really decreased people's anxiety. Like, what am I supposed to learn here? How am I supposed to learn it? And, what, you know, uh, how, how can, I, can, can I do it? Um, timely feedback. That's something that's come up in literature over and over again, is getting that timely feedback in the online world as well. High, high quality course materials, and it's the same for both, but again needed uh, there. And, and, and high quality also incurring in terms of the technology. So things that break up, things that links don't work, it, it's just not conducive to a good learning environment. And small group structure. And this was interesting because this was online, but they didn't have, you could have, you know, you could have 30 people in a chat line, in a chat group. They found when they had a smaller groups in their chat and smaller groups in their discussion, people can see, you can see who else is on, on there. And again, maybe uh, it's the feeling of more intimidating. There's a lot of people listening online, whereas the smaller groups were more conducive. And of course, they saved money. I mean, their study showed that their course dropped from 280 per student to about $103 per student. Callister and Love, um, uh, they examined the impact of face-to-face -face for a skills-based learning uh, program. And this was interesting. This was in, uh, I've kind of tried to cover, there's not a ton of research in each area, but marketing and, and uh, has a lot of uh, um, uh, information on this, as well as statistics, uh, statistics courses. And this one was a market, uh, master's level marketing course, and it was about negotiating. And they found that um, students in the face-to-face -face actually negotiated higher then students, they had to go through a sort of a technique and they had to negotiate with someone and the, some, the students did better in the f who were in the face-to-face. -face. They were able to negotiate. They had that skill to negotiate higher than those in the online. But there were no differences in their grades of their final exam. So it really felt like the cognitive was equal. They both learned the same knowledge, but the social outcomes perhaps were not. The online students may be missing that sort of relationship uh, development where they can sort of collectively create and sort of interact with others and hear and learn from others sort of in that in, that in the moment time. So basically what we're finding is online is effective for introductory, introductory, declarative, or surface type of learning. And yes, some of the topics that we're going to be covering here are introductory. They're surface. They're basic. They're sort of what's autism or, you know, what are the services that are out there you need to know about, um, you know, uh, that sort of stuff. So, so that, that really works well for us. But um, that doesn't preclude, that doesn't mean that uh, 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 Lou uh, and Lemonade talked about that online teaching higher level or skill, higher level skills, they just mean more difficult. We just have to 
do a little more work here to, to figure this out, to make this work for us. And so um, really, as a result of sort of that research that, that I've been diving into, sort of themselves, and uh, there's another uh, Bartley and, and Golak here, um, another um, reference, I've sort of done a list of what are the key elements we need to consider moving forward now as we develop. And so uh, the key elements are, of course, D you know, a clear, concise, succinct description of either the skill or the procedure, if we're going to be teaching procedural skills or, or, or things like that, clearly articulated expectations and objectives. In, in ensuring that we have high quality course materials, both, uh, you know, uh, print and uh, uh, te technology. Um, we want to deliberately, if we're thinking about integrating a uh, train-to-trainer model or if we're thinking about integrating some sort of face-to-face -face component with the online component, uh, a lot of the research is showing you have to do that quite deliberately. You can't just stick a, um, an online thing and put a face and then add some technology pieces because then people, what the research shows, they just start clicking on like, oh, I better say something in this discussion so that I can get a mark. Right? It's, it's not really, it's, it, th they're not truly integrated. So, you know, we can't just take it and put it online. We have to carefully plan. And we have to embed interactive elements to, in, 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 to, in, to include a lot of learning styles. So, um, they have ideas like there should be digital mini lectures. There can be animated presentations. You can have um, a similar voiceover like the people are watching here, which is just a talking head like a face-to-face -face lecture. Some people really like that as well. Different learning styles. There can be interactive multimedia activities that have immediate feedback. As soon as you try that activity out, it tells you if you got it right or wrong or what you should do. Um, and then you, it, you it also have time to repeat and try again and revisit. Some of the other things we have to actively think about are actively planning for social and interactive learning, considering sort of small group discussions, discussion uh, groups online rather than larger groups. Um, provide opportunities uh, and then provide opportunities for how are we going to, and this is, I don't know all the answers to this, how are we going to get people to role play? How are we going to get people to practice in a real life situation? Um, you know, maybe have a simulation where they can try or they can, you know, get a partner and try something out. How are we going to encourage people to problem solve after they've done some things? And how are we going to encourage people to self-reflect? And so through all of this, again, we need to have a, a mechanism for timely feedback and for people to evaluate themselves. Um, uh, the, uh, the final two are providing access to ongoing support from mentors and specialists. And as I've talked to people across the province, people have talked about sort of a mentor match. Like, you know, perhaps there needs to be some sort of mentor in each of the fields that we could connect with and that might rotate to different folks. Um, and then, of course, providing access to quick and accurate technical support services because that can just, the whole thing can go off the rails if suddenly you've got a screen and you've got the little circle and a circle and a circle and you hate it and you're checking your computer and, you know, you're cursing circus name and all the rest. So, <laughs> so what's next? So now we've set those priorities. Um, we are, as I said, we're going to examine the development of advisory uh, committees and working groups. We're going to take this information about sort of what we know about adult learning and how can we get it in, uh, involved and, and how do we include it. That's kind of the how do people want to learn. So there's, again, the three questions. Now we know who needs to be targeted. We're going to ask what do they need to know and how do they need to know it uh, to be able to get that behavior change. Um, and these groups are really going to um, provide the advice and make the recommendations regarding sort of the types of resources that will be developed. You know, is it a module? Is it a handout? Is it a, you know, is it something else that's online that we're looking at? We just don't know those, ex those answers yet. We have some ideas, but we want to make sure it works for that profession. We also want to make it sure that it works for professional development so that people can, so that we're not creating something and then it's not worth, you can't get your continuing education credits for it. So we have to take uh, all that into consideration. 
And we also are examining um, and, and we're engaging in, so those are our three overall um, topics that we're looking at, but we are also, uh, Circa is looking at um, engaging with other organizations um, that have a special interest in the area of priorities. For example, um, we're partnering with um, Aboriginal IDP and Aboriginal SCD. Um, they, have a, they have a whole system, it's called the Partnerships Project, where they create um, modules. So we're working with them to um, update and create their autism and really the developmental disorder module. So there's a variety of other things that we're, we're working on to, um, uh, with other interest groups to promote. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, uh, hopefully over the next uh, th you know, three years, we'll be producing stuff. If we're not, the, um, uh, the government will be angry. Um, uh, but certainly um, that's it. And that's my, these are my, I just love Temple Grandin and Dr. Shore. And when I met them, I would look how excited I am. I'm you such a geek. I know Temple is yeah, Temple's super excited. I'm like, oh, I'm talking to her and holding her book. <laughs> and Stephen Shore, I sort of accosted him at IMFAR and kind of stood around the bagel spot with him for a while <laughs> until I got the guts to ask him if somebody could take a picture with him. So, um, yeah, so those are my, uh, yeah.